Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Moppert, back here with Paul Hamilton. Paul, we spoke a few weeks ago, and then most recently we spoke right before the draft, mm -hmm. but a lot has happened since then. So we have a lot to talk about today, and let's start obviously where we left off at the draft. So I have to give it to you. Uh, when we spoke, you did say <laughs> you kind of called the Zach Benson pick at 13. You said, you know, that was one of the guys that you had your eyes on. Were you, I mean, you said it, but were you necessarily surprised or kind of that he fell to 13 as many were? Well, the reason he did is a lot of people didn't think defensemen were going to go before like 15. Well, I didn't believe that. And sure enough, three defensemen went in the top 11. That knocked him down to the Sabres, and the Sabres, as they said, it got to be like pick 11, and they're like, oh, wow, he might get to us. I don't think they were expecting that. And then they were trying to get back in the first round because there was a player, which they wouldn't say, that they wanted to go get, and then the first round ended, so they spent all morning trying to get up in the second round because they were at 39. They couldn't do that, and sure enough, Anton Wahlberg's there. And that's the guy they wanted. I see why now, now that he's been to development camp, I understand why they had a first round grade on him and why they wanted him, you know, big, strong type of a winger centerman who's just going to get bigger and stronger, but has some skill and talent along with it. And, and you kind of went right into it. That was my next topic about Anton and how, how ironic that is that they don't move up to get Benson, right? But they land him at 13 and then they're trying and trying and trying and then turns out he's there when they need him to be. So um, now we're going to move into our next topic. Obviously, development camp just wrapped up yesterday. It was a couple days long, started on Sunday, went through Thursday. Um, so a lot to take in. They say that the goal of development camp isn't necessarily what the players are doing out on the ice. They say that, of course, you know, it, they say it's about what it means to be an NHL player and, you know, habits and the schedule and also for the Sabres themselves, what it means to be a Buffalo Sabre. They say that all week long. But for you, you know, you were there every day. What was your biggest takeaway or maybe some of your top takeaways and these guys are going to grow up together too they got to get to know each other I mean very few of them know each other so you got guys from, from the U.S. meeting the guys from Russia who just came over for the first time who don't speak English very well but still you find a way to communicate and that's a, what this camp is all about but you know we hear about you know the Sabres have six number one picks that haven't played in there or in with the Sabres yet so we know all about them but you know we didn't know much about the Russian guys because they haven't been here. We don't get a chance to see them. And over they come, and you got Nikita Novikov and Viktor Nuchev, who were just very, very good all week long. Uh, the defenseman, uh, Novikov, he's like 6'3 already. He looks like he wants to hit. But he wasn't hitting his teammates, but he competes. He's also a little nifty, too, as a defenseman. You know, he can get up ice. Now, we can't tell really what kind of defenseman he is in a three-on-three. -three. We'll find that out when we get to... Uh, the, the prospects tournament that uh, they call it the prospects challenge in, in uh, September. They'll compete in that. Maybe Benson and Tavoy will be on the same line again because they'll both be there for that. So that's when we get to see those guys in a five on five setting and just find out about them. But folks in Rochester, I think they're really going to like these two Russians and Kisikov will be there. He was there last year. So they're trying they're starting to find out about the six Russians that they've drafted. And they've got some good ones there. So it's not just the high picks that you hear about that maybe are going to become Sabres. You see some other guys like uh, Jake Richard, uh, even a guy like Joel Radovic Bernson, who, you know, scored the goal to win the game, then tie the game, and then he wins the next game. You know, this is a seventh round pick. Where did he come from type of a thing? And you see those guys wondering, are these guys good enough that maybe they can grow into Sabres as well as the higher picks? Right, and like you said, it's the first opportunity for a lot of people to kind of get a look at those guys and the Russian players, as you said, and, and that makes sense as to why there was such a big turnout throughout the week. But, um, and as, as we talked about the top pick, so Benson, yes, obviously there's those other guys that maybe people aren't talking about, but Benson, we, we talked about that the final day, the three-on-three. -three. What was your take? I already know how you felt about this a little bit, but how he came out and started out on the ice during the three-on-threes. Yeah, I think he was just trying too hard. It wasn't like he was dogging it. He was trying to do too much because he wanted to impress. I think he really enjoyed. That place was 80 90% filled on a Thursday morning on a work day. 
And I think he was like, wow, look at all these people here. I want to show them that why the Sabres took me number one. And you could see a lot of the skill, but he was trying to go through three guys. And when he just simplified it a little bit, Zach Benson showed up. And when he did, he made some beautiful plays out there. I mean, he, his passing, he had some scoring chances where he didn't put them away. He did score the empty net goal. But this tenaciousness, you know, where I don't have the puck, I got to go get it back. And he did. He just flew up the ice in the neutral zone, lifted the guy's stick, and out he goes the other way. And he sets up a guy for a scoring chance. I believe it did wind up being a goal. So we got to see him. And if I go by first impressions only, and that's all I have to go on, I'm probably a little more impressed by Benson than I am with Savoy as far as just the first impressions I get from them, seeing them. Now, Savoy wasn't in camp last year, but I've seen him a little bit in junior. I saw his two games in Rochester. And if I just go by first impressions, I actually have liked Benson a little better than Savoy, but they both have a long ways to go, I mean, other than just first impressions. Right, and, and afterwards, uh, Don Granato, he addressed the media. For the first time in a while, we've been hearing a lot from Kevin Adams, of course, with the draft. Um, and he mentioned that he felt like he was very impressed, but he, he did say that he got better as the day went on. Um, another thing that he did address, uh, we heard Kevin Adams talk about Jack Quinn's injury and how he'll be out for the top of the season. Um, what do you think that we haven't really gotten the chance to talk mm -hmm. about this again? It kind of news dropped on the second day of the draft. What do you think about um, Quinn's presence or rather his absence um, for this Sabres team? I think Quinn and Paterka both have chances to be 25, 30 goal scorers in the National Hockey League. Whether it's this coming season, I can't say. I think you'll see an improvement, a definite improvement from what they learned in their rookie years. So I think it's tough for the Sabres because, you know, they're part of the, the plan. They're part of the Cousins line of the top six forwards and a, an important part. He is a he's probably their best penalty killer right now. He turned he and Tuck really turned into as, as bad as the team was penalty killing. Those two, I thought, were really good at it. And he was probably the best I saw. So they will miss him from that aspect also. So what do you do? I'm not sure Kolik and Savoy are ready. For the NHL, I think Rusick is. He's older. He was the leading scorer for Rochester last year. He was an excellent two-way player. His two games here in Buffalo, I thought he showed very well. So he might be the guy that comes in and maybe gets the opportunity before the two young kids who are 19, 20, you know, 20 years old. I still think they need a little bit more development. We'll see in training camp. We'll see how they fare there. But it wouldn't surprise me if Rusick might be the guy instead of the other two. Yes, and, you know, you kind of had touched on that. You asked Granado on, that was Thursday, um, you know, if that was something that they had to go out and get, which we'll touch on that in a minute about free agency, but or whether it was something they could get within. And he did talk about how they feel like they're really growing from within and, and how they wouldn't need to go out and get someone. Um, so, again, that brings me to my next topic about free agency and how they've had a pretty successful um, offseason in terms of what they wanted and what they got. They got exactly what they wanted, who they wanted. Um, they've touched on that many times. They said Kevin Adams had mentioned that defensemen were a priority um, as they head into the offseason. And um, two of those guys, uh, that is Connor Clifton and Eric Johnson, uh, you know, they were both taken very early as soon as free agency had opened. So let's start with Johnson, a veteran voice uh, for the defenseman, Darlene Power Samuelson. Uh, what's your take on him and, and how you feel that he could impact that room specifically? Well, with the salary cap hardly going up, this is the first free agency I have ever seen where you could get reasonable contracts at reasonable term. And I thought both those guys were reasonable. And they both are going to help the penalty kill. You can't have one of the worst penalty kill teams in the league like the Sabres did. And Johnson talked about it with us. He was with Colorado before they won the Stanley Cup and when they won the Stanley Cup. Colorado has a lot of high-end players that can score goals. He said when those high-end players finally figured out that they do have to play a little bit of defense and that when they play it well, you wind up with the puck. When, when you limit opportunities, that means you have the puck and you have more chances to score. He said that's probably the thing that the Sabres have to learn. 
that, you know, they'll be a tough out if they learn that, you know what, if we just play a little better defensively, and that means find the middle of the ice, not leave it open, penalty kill better, they'll be a better team. And Kevin Adams even said, he goes, who better than Eric Johnson to say it? He goes, I can say it. The coaching staff can say it, but he says when one of your peers sitting in the locker room says it, who has won the Stanley Cup, it might resonate a little bit better for the rest of the team, knowing that you've got to tighten up just a little bit. And if you do, the sky's the limit. And that was one of my favorite things that uh, Kevin Adams had said when he addressed the media about the Johnson signing. He said, am I doing, that was the topic, was am I doing enough for these younger defensemen. You know, he, he talked about a personal experience sitting in between maybe some veterans and, and learning in a way that, as you mentioned, he can't do or, or they would take advice from him in a different way. Um, and Granato also said on Thursday that a benefit for Johnson was that he could see him getting paired with any of those guys and there would be benefits. Be. Exactly, and there would be benefits for all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so now looking to Connor Clifton and, and his signing, obviously had some background with Granado. How much do you think that had to do with his decision? Let's see, Greenway, Thompson, Clifton, I'm missing some. It, it, it matters a lot. It matters a lot that they have a history. He knows this player. He knows what makes him tick and you know, he knows how he can make him be better. So that's, that's a lot of that goes into that where he knows the player. So Kevin Adams doesn't have to guess what kind of person is this. Don Granado knows because he's been around him. He's coached him, even though they were younger when he coached him, but still. So that, that matters a lot. And so Granado said those are the two guys when he looked at free agency, those were the two guys he wanted to target. And you know, Clifton's been around a little bit now. He's played in the Boston Bruins. So he's played on a darn good team. So he knows what it takes to be a good team. Now they failed in the playoffs, but they were one of the best regular season teams that have ever been. And so he, he went through that. He's lived through that. He's more mature. So when you've got Eric Johnson in the locker room, and as you mentioned, look at Alex Tuck, who's on either side of him. Jack Quinn, J.J. Paterka. That's who's on the either side of Alex Tuck. Eric Johnson, you might wind up having Samuelson and Power on each, either side, or Darlene and Power on either side of him. You know, just to have that available to them. Because remember how much they used to talk about the leadership of uh, Craig Anderson all the time. You know, what he brings. Well, now Johnson is going to be that guy. And now the defenseman, who, Darlene and Power, they've got a guy in there who's been the number one overall pick three number one overall picks on your defense, you know, so he can help them with that kind of pressure that he knows what they're going through. And the leadership thing I just had to mention because I thought this was, this was crazy when he said it, but uh, the fact that Johnson and Oposo were roommates in college. How about that? So yeah. another guy who that younger locker room looks towards, but uh, another thing that has kind of been roaming is now that you've got Johnson and you've got Clifton, it's kind of, I, I forget the exact number, but you've got a surplus of, of nine. defensemen, nine. So do you think, is that a good problem or a bad problem to have? It's a good problem, but you can't go in the season with nine. All right, now you can, people get all hung up with one-way deals. That doesn't mean you can't send them to Rochester. All that means is if they go to Rochester, they make their NHL salary, that's all. So you could send Bryson to Rochester if you want to, he's going to make his NHL salary. Uh, you get you get a little bit of relief in the salary cap, not much, not that they need it. Um, so if if one of those three defense, extra defensemen isn't traded, you can send one down and you're fine. But then you're only going to have one extra forward and two extra D. It doesn't leave room for an extra goalie for those who think they want to have three goalies. We saw that last year where. Okay, for two days we got to put Quinn down in Rochester. We didn't really send him there, but he's got to go there on paper. We bring him back. Now Krebs has to go down for two days. You can do that for a little while like they did, but it's not workable. You can't do that. So you, they really can't go with three goaltenders. Again, if they, if they have the three and they don't do anything different in that, Comrie probably gets waived and, and gets sent to Rochester or gets traded. 
And surely we will figure all of that out and we'll we'll get to see how that plays out next up uh, for the Sabres. As you mentioned earlier is the prospect challenge um, followed up with training camp. So of course, Paul, I'm sure that we will chat before that about things that pop up and everything. But that's all we have for now. So Paul, thank you for joining me and we will see you next time.